So our final presentation today, and then we'll have time for some questions to Georgina, as well as our next presenters, is from the city of Whittlesea. And I'd like to welcome Narelle Bazinas and Tim Connell, who are both from the city of Whittlesea, to talk us through nature play in Whittlesea, a four-prong approach. So welcome Narelle and Tim, and I'll hand over to you. Great, right. thank you very much um, for that, Bob. Um, and all our other speakers. I just want to start by uh, yeah, just acknowledging that we recognise the rich Aboriginal heritage of the country, that we acknowledge the Wurundjeri Willem clan and Tanurong people as the traditional owners of the land here at the city of Whittlesea, which is in Melbourne's outer northern suburbs. Uh, you've... Hi everyone. We thought we would start our presentation by showing you a quick video from our first pop-up bush play group we had here in Whittlesea back in 2019. We want to share this because some of you may not, some of you online may not be familiar with this movement and it's becoming increasingly popular. While the video plays, we'd just like to give a big shout out to NGAA for having us here today. Uh, spring is usually our busiest time of the year, so taking this moment to reflect on our journey in developing nature play in Whittlesea is a real treat. So just to clarify that Tim and I, we, we aren't childhood educators. We come from natural resource management backgrounds, and we spent the last two decades working on public conservation reserves. We're also parents, so we've seen the positive impacts on nature-based education on our children. Our work in Whittlesea with nature play has all been about, has been about partnership and support planning, coordination, encouragement, and enabling these activities to thrive. The benefits of nature play are well known. So our focus over the past seven years is about the activation of the open space to create opportunities for nature-based activities to thrive. So what have been the policy or strategy settings that have made nature play grow uh, to where it is presently? Um, and we can really start seeing this as a normal activity of what can happen. Our municipal health plan in 2017 was probably the first formal document to recognise nature play here in council and really got the ball rolling for us. The health plan recognised the importance of connecting green, uh, connection to green spaces at all life stages. And so nature play is really targeting one of those life stages being the early years or under fires, which is very well represented in our community. Uh, in our present policy settings, Council's environment, sustainable environment strategy includes a lot of key directions and actions that encourage appropriate use and custodianship of public open spaces, including things like our biodiversity events. Um, we all know that in Melbourne, uh, the negative impacts of COVID lockdowns, but really a positive outcome was the reconnection with local open space. We were absolutely aware of this underutilization of local parks as a phenomenon here in our growth area at Whittlesea prior to COVID. So it was quite positive to see that our pandemic response plan included the actions around maintaining a positive connection to local parks and open, open space. Um, our community recovery committee also put forward actions um, around proposals to establish more nature play activities and spaces. Uh, so how have we responded to this specifically as land managers? Firstly, really through delivering lots of events in our open space, through supporting a community of practice around nature play, and as an extension of that, supporting the educators who are ready and willing to get out and about into local reserves. And finally, through networking, advocacy, um, scraping and groveling, <laughs> but developing the right business cases to seek sec and secure investment in the spaces that will hopefully become some of the hubs for these informal activities in our future open space network. So our events, we can break down our event delivery into three main categories. The first category is our large events and public reserves. So these are, these are extremely well attended. Our, our goals include um, activating the reserves and showing people what's possible and what's encouraged as sensitive use, teaching about the local environment through our skills and um, of the team and the service providers, building social connections and improving physical and mental health by getting kids moving and away from the screens, uh, keeping it low cost and low impact, enjoying the bush without creating waste, all while ensuring that everyone's having fun. 
So these events have been super popular, attracting anywhere from 500 to 1,500 people, mainly young families, making them a great fit for growth areas where young families are highly uh, represented. So category number two is the pop-up nature play event. These are weekday events and they're designed for families who aren't necessarily already part of the early years services or want a more diverse uh, playgroup experience. It's a great way to include and introduce parents and carers to outdoor playgroups and normalise nature play focused, uh, nature focused play. The third category is the Family Nature Club. Now, this is a new and exciting initiative we started recently. It's a smaller targeted program that offers the benefits of the larger events while providing a more supportive and safer environment, which may address some of the complex issues arising from poor social connectedness, such as economic disadvantage, social isolation, or um, cultural differences. We partner with the early years teams and the community development officers to better understand the community's specific needs as our family nature groups um, are quite diverse. So the Family Nature Club has, has thrived in areas like Donnybrook, which is one of Whittlesey's newest and rapidly growing neighbourhoods. So Donnybrook has grown significantly, um, up 30% of, well, of the population is around 25 to 34 year old um, couples or couples with children under 11 years old. 44% of Donnybrook um, of the population there is also born overseas. So for these young families, this sort of low cost local park activity, which is facilitated and supported with things like language services has been really well received. For many participants, this has been their first chance to connect with the local environment around them. And it allows kids to explore nature, uh, get their hands dirty and play with sticks and bark and jump in muddy puddles. <laughs> the community of practice started back around 2018. We saw that other councils doing nature play were having issues around overuse and impacts on uh, na na nature reserves. So we decided that it's, it would be best to be proactive and work out which sites were resilient and best suited to this activity. Working with our health planners, uh, we developed some preliminary guidelines to encourage greater nature play. Uh, and from that, we created some site specific fact sheets um, that were really about yeah, inviting the community into the, the spaces where we thought this was appropriate. Um, with our early years team, we hosted a conference in 2022 called the Whittlesea Early Years Conservation Conference. Um, so this included also early years and, and participants from neighbouring councils. And it really brought together around 300 educators in the early years space um, from family daycare, playgroups, kinders and childcare. Um, the event aimed to inspire the uh, educators with keynote speakers like Costa from Gardening Australia, reaffirming a lot of those benefits around young people engaging with. Um, it also had a lot of hands-on activities for the educators. Um, we also looked at doing things like inviting service providers from TAC and road safety authorities to come and talk about developing transport plans so that people could connect with um, some of their risk concerns and apprehensions around going out and getting into bush settings. So the early years educators, they are the real champions of the nature play and having them on board with us is crucial for our mission. So back in 2017, we hopped on a bus with many others from the early years team. We set off to explore various sites from parks, woodlands, hilly landscapes to the creeks. So we, we had some really enlightening conversations with them about nature play and what we could do in the council open space areas together. Then in 2022, after some inspiring discussions at the earliest conference that Tim just spoke about, we launched an expression of interest process and we discovered that there were 12, in, 12 enthusiastic centres ready to go on outdoor adventures. So we partnered then with two great facilitators, the Merry Creek Management Committee, they focused on the Western growth area and Eco Explorers worked with the groups in the Eastern Plenty River catchment areas. It's been so far an amazing journey. So around capital investment, some councils, as we mentioned, have left these activities go unmanaged and a bit organic. Um, really, I think our experience is that um, looking at what's happened there and some of the impacts to local flora, fauna, biodiversity, we want to avoid those experiences. So site selection, 
um, being able to clearly identify the needs of both the educators and our land managers is really critical to retrofitting this sort of activity into our open space network. Um, in some of the growth areas like Woolert in Melbourne's north, um, we have many new local conservation reserves that are being um, planned and they're really being protected primarily for the protection of rare and threatened endangered ground flora, rare lilies and orchids and things uh, that can be trampled even by small little people feet. So identifying the right sites is really important for maintaining those other biodiversity commitments that we have. But there's equally a large number of other local conservation reserves that have been established to comply with our things like our river red gum protection policy. And we think that there's plenty of in-between space that we can try and maximise and utilise um, rather than simply fence off. So the conversation on getting the right site is one that, um, a site that's fit for purpose, uh, it's resilient and it's safe. It's involved stakeholders like our earlier staff, conservation officers, risk managers, park maintenance, contract managers um, and arborists. We've worked closely with our landscape uh, development and assessment team uh, to try and salvage some of the materials in growth areas, um, things like logs and rocks and so on, to repurpose those natural elements into habitat. But more recently, we're now looking to repurpose a lot of that material into informal play areas um, near conservation reserves and really provide that opportunity for a step in for the, any host groups running nature play. Well, this is often um, opportunistic. I suppose our next challenge is really um, is more just, is around taking a more planned approach to these spaces, and we're really looking also at how do we develop some maintenance specifications that can align with um, service contracts and so on to ensure that these spaces are don't just become a forgotten wild space, but they they do remain uh, fit for purpose for community use, just like we would expect for really any park or open space asset. So what have the last seven years taught us about this activity at the City of Whittlesea? Number one is that partnerships are crucial. There is no way that we could have done this as land managers alone. It has required many extended conversations with internal and external stakeholders to get where we are. Um, our neighbours uh, may have some different approaches and challenges, but knowledge sharing is really critical for that efficiency. We know that educators are extremely time poor and have very limited availability for professional development. Uh, so it's important that we continue to support that community of practice approach. Working with the land managers. So identifying the right activity sites that prioritise capacity and resilience. These activities aim to create uh, and to increase environmental environment and biodiversity appreciation. And the outcomes should, shouldn't come at a cost of, of the environment itself. I suppose when I reflect back on um, the elements that could have we, we could have done better in the last seven years, and this has come up in conversations today, I think probably one of the missing pieces for us is that idea of community champions. It's often challenging, obviously, in a new growth area where the community hasn't established, but that voice of the community champions is often a much swifter catalyst of change than simply council officers um, putting forward these sorts of requests. Mm -hmm. It is hard to be part of every discussion in busy growth municipality, but we have had amazing open space planners here at Whittlesea who actively drive good outcomes. Establishing good relationships with them has been an important tool that has at times opened doors to conversations and opportunities with changing land use and open space estate. And finally, as a service, we really should be aiming for self-sufficiency in the long term. So ongoing facilitation it probably isn't a sustainable option for Whittlesea Council in the longer term. So defining those roles and responsibilities with groups like the educators is super important. So thanks again for letting us chat to you today about Nature Play and our journey. Um, it's been it's been fun to let you know how, how we are travelling. And I suppose I hope that this glimpse of our work with Nature Play at Whittlesea is has really shown you what um, can be some of the normalised passive recreational uses. And I really think that this is something that we can plan for and encourage in our growing cities um, with that overall aim to lift activation and appreciation of our open spaces. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Narelle and Tim. And really inspired by that presentation. And I think having some of that beautiful open space is a feature of many growth areas, 
because we are at that interface with regional Australia. So to think that there are many open spaces like that available for such projects is great.